Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Vincent Burke and I'm a student at UCCS and a staff member for UCCS downtown. I'd like to thank you for joining us on today's session for Hamilton. This is session two and we'll be featuring two faculty from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, who specialize in critically analyzing the history of the United States. Nick Lee, an instructor in the sociology department and Jared Benson, a history lecturer will be joining us. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to be discussing uh, the real history of Alexander Hamilton uh, juxtaposed next to the production, which, uh, you know, we had had on the first session and uh, how this has sort of affected the American historical trajectory uh, through myth and narrative. Uh, for these discussions, we're going to kind of assume that, uh, you know, the listeners and the viewers have already seen um, the, the stage production or the film and or know a little bit about Alexander Hamilton, uh, just kind of like as a founding father or founding father. Uh, this won't be a typical uh, question and answer discussion. It's gonna be more of just a uh, general laid back sort of uh, flowing conversation about Hamilton himself. Uh, so uh, to kind of kick this off, when we as Americans talk about Alexander Hamilton uh, after the production has been out, oftentimes the real history kind of gets mixed up due to an assumed version of history that's fostered by uh, media and sanctioned narratives. So um, really quickly before we begin, I just want to let everyone know that the conversation today may challenge your understanding, understanding and common perceptions of American history, and we find that that's okay. You, find, you may find yourself agreeing or disagreeing with what's about to be said, and that's also just as all right. Um, but we think it's important to be able to understand the true history of what's going on. So uh, without further ado, can you two kick us off about uh, the life of Alexander Hamilton? First off, I just want to say I'm so proud that you had to provide a disclaimer for our session. That makes me happy. <laughs> um, no, yeah, Jerry and I want to talk about really, I mean, this question has been asked and answered, I think, many times regarding the historical accuracy of Hamilton. And I think more important than addressing sort of the minute details of the musical, um, for example, like, did he really meet Lafayette in a bar before the revolution? Well, like that was impossible because Lafayette wasn't in the colonies until 1777. But that's like inconsequential. What we really want to discuss is kind of, I think, the themes of the story, the narrative that's told in the musical and whether or not those are accurate and what that means for our understanding of history and sort of this creation of the myth of the hero, I think. So uh, Jared will take it from there a little bit. Yeah, I mean, for those of you that are looking for kind of rich detail on a lot of like the little nuances that we see in the musical, whether they were correct, did he meet these people, did he say these things, et cetera, that's actually going back to when this, this musical was released all the way back in 2015, 2016. That's already been done. Uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, Lyra Montero, Ishmael Reed, Ava DuVernay, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Schusler, I believe, um, they've all written quite a bit about this or talked quite a bit about this. And so that's not necessarily what Nick or myself really want to do today. We want to kind of talk about the socialization efforts of narratives like this, whether they're intentional or not. So we're not like calling out the directors or the writers in this case they too are socialized into thinking, speaking, and acting in certain ways. We do want to talk about what this thinking, speaking, and acting, and historical omission, and kind of shaping narrative does in terms of, of reproduction of certain ideals, values, hero worship. And that's what we really want to kind of talk about today. Do you want to add anything with that, Nick? No, that's good. Okay. So the way in which history is constructed and delivered is more important than actual history itself more times than not, um, contrary to popular belief. Uh, facts, dates, that's all super awesome, but I, I try not to focus on those in my classroom because it's really just good for bar trivia. We want to talk about the way the story is because it's these, or the story is told, because it's these narratives that are subjective and they're subjective to the individuals and societies that create them, not the ones that live them. So in turn, the story of the past is actually meant to perpetuate society as it exists now. Um, some call this presentism. The stories often overlook certain people or ideas or events while emphasizing others. In this case, it's Hamilton. We're emphasizing this individual while overlooking a whole bunch of other amazing heroes, and we'll get to them later, that perhaps this story should have been about. Um, in many cases, events are entirely manufactured, uh, you know, Hamilton being an abolitionist <clears throat> um, or reshaped. In this fashion, like history starts to it starts to resemble like mythology. And, and, and you know, we, we've, we use that term um, 
intentionally and, and not necessarily without like thinking about the consequences of talking about it that way, but it is, it's intentional. These myths shape identity, politics, economics, gender roles, social hierarchy, conflict theory, a whole bunch of important things. Um, and they inform on the above mentioned aspects of societies to kind of like, I mean, they do, they condition us to promote patriotism or exceptionalism, or in a positive respect, they could promote unity. Um, negatively, they can create others, but there are a lot of consequential results in shaping history uh, the way we see fit, kind of like loosely and liberally without kind of like following what actually happened. Well, and I um, wanna add that oftentimes, right, historians that challenge the dominant narrative are labeled as revisionist or you know all kinds of different radical yeah exactly and i think that we have to understand that even if you critique let's say american history we have to understand that every single nation has an origin story it has a mythological narrative that tells the story of the nation from the beginning all the way up into the present every single country does that uh, in fact, it's required to have, in order to have a state, it must have some kind of origin story, some kind of story that tells its history so that people can relate to it and identify it so that essentially it can come into being. Um, so America is not unique in this case by any means. And to kind of put it in plain language, the, the problem I suppose we have before we dig into some of the things that we're going to talk about, the problem we have with these inaccurate stories or manufacturing heroes out of individuals, to be blunt, that shouldn't have been made into heroes, um, is that again, like you, these stories literally mean to socialize people into how they're going to conduct themselves in their society as it exists now. So turning a potential slave trader, um, you know, into a hero, that's a problem. That, that makes it, it almost rationalizes what happened. Turning people that advocated for the ethnic cleansing of First Nations into heroes, that's a problem because that rationalizes our behaviors now and why we're here now. So it's not that these things are inconsequential, they are actually very consequential. Um, and like Jared stated very quickly, but I wanna also just touch on, it's not as if uh, like the writers and directors and producers intentionally do this, right? Like their intention is to create something that's wildly entertaining and I'm sure they have other motives as well, but this is a, this is a latent function of all popular media that it tells a story that has consequences for how people believe, how people relate to one another, how people relate to their government and so on. Yeah, and 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 so for those that that might not understand like the importance of 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 creating this and this is not our term but like a founder chic over these individuals that by our standards now and even for the standards of their time were to be blunt wildly immoral moral if not unethical again those the, we use those terms intentionally each and every one of these individuals also advocated for ethnic cleansing of ind indigenous peoples or were part of the slaving uh, industry like it, they were definitely uh part of the patriarchy so we can kind of rationalize away well they were just products of their time but there were also individuals, and we will start naming names here towards the end of this, that actually called them out at the time for these unethical or immoral actions and views. So it's not like they just didn't know any better. They knew better, were being called out, and still chose to act um, and think the way they did. So it's not with, again, this isn't like, again, using our present way of looking at the world to judge them. This is people of their era also using their morals and ethics, et cetera, to call out these individuals of their time. So, I mean, without further ado, let's, let's kind of dig back into Hamilton himself and talk about why this is important. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the lack of abolitionism in his life. Um, I think the musical did pretty good using uh, Lorenz as like the main, the primary abolitionist. That's, that's real. Uh, he really was. Um, however, the, the calling out Thomas Jefferson for owning slaves, yes, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves, um, that is a problem, but it made it seem like Hamilton was somehow anti that. Most historical sources don't, don't reveal that at all. Like Hamilton and again, most of his economic measures almost uh, required a slave-based economy, particularly in the South. So, you know, that's wildly important. And we kind of want to talk about his life a little bit here. Uh, he did immigrate from the uh, the the Caribbean 
but he immigrated from one British colony to another British colony. Other historians have already called this out. Is this really immigration? Was this like really having to learn a whole new way of life? It's debatable. I, I don't know. I mean, do you have anything you want to add to that, Nick? I mean, I mean, the immigrant story I, I is a big part of the story. The, I, I suppose we should touch on it, but. Yeah, I, I mean, that's basically, in my opinion of the story, that is probably like the most emphasized aspect of his life, right? Definitely. The, immigrant that works his way up from quote unquote nothing and kind of writes his way into the history books, uh, so to speak, to use like the most cliche term ever. Um, and I, I think that's like unjustly overemphasized as you just alluded to, like you said, it was from one British colony to another um, and he had white skin and I, it, it makes a hero out of an immigrant that probably shouldn't be made a hero of, like you just said, for that Very reason. Bearing in mind that he was a trader, and we don't have a, a lot of detail of all of the goods and services that were traded when he was in the Caribbean as a teen, um, working as a trader. But if we're honest with ourselves, in the mid to uh, late 1700s, if you're a trader in the Caribbean, there is a good to fair chance that what you're trading in uh, oftentimes is humans. So that must at least kind of be addressed. At least knew about it, at the very least. Yeah, 100%. Right. Um, so that's wildly important. But regardless, uh, we know he ends up in Boston, uh, eventually goes to New York City, is self-educated. We do. That's real. Uh, very smart man. Um, amazing writer. All of those things are true. Yep. Self-educated. And, and that's important. Um, so this kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps is partially true. But as, as, as Nick correctly asserted, it wasn't nearly as hard to pull yourself up by your bootstraps as a white man in the 1700s as we like to make it out to be. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, I, that's important. Now, as far as uh, the what took place during like the war for independence, um, we probably should credit Hamilton a little bit for taking up um, against uh, uh, what he perceived as British tyranny. The musical is a little bit cliche in uh, in its storytelling here, and I do feel like it's important to note that that this kind of monolithic British tyrannical evil that we see in basically like every American origin story. I don't know that this musical really needed to fall into that. Um, I mean, the British were just doing what empires do at the time, uh, arguably what the United States in a way does now. Um, they were taxing their citizens, um, and and that's what happened. I mean, they were taxing the citizens for actually two conflicts that their citizens started, one known as the French and Indian War, and then the second was their uh, constant land grabbing led to Pontiac's Rebellion, which required British troops um, to basically protect the colonies, and that cost money, so um, the British felt like they needed to tax them. That's often left out of the story. I think it's an important part of the story uh, that all Americans probably need to know that the British didn't just wake up one day and roll over and they're like, Let's just tax people for no reason. So anyway, any thoughts on that, Nick? No, I agree that that's an important, I mean, now we're getting to like sort of the sacred history, right? The excessive taxation and so on, which uh, I think is often overstated because that other side of the story is not told, right? The British perspective is never told. I mean, exactly. I mean, they're tyrants. I, that's that's the story we're told. They just started taxing people, not representing them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the representation, of course, is a debate we don't have time to get into here, but there was this thing called virtual representation as echoed by a dude named, I believe his name was Thomas Watley uh, back in parliament. But regardless, these colonists also fell under the British Bill of Rights, so it wasn't like they had no rights either. Um, but anyway, these are all like little parts of the story that uh, are wildly important because it does fall back into that cliche that Hamilton fought as a revolutionary hero against this monolithic tyrannical evil. Um, it doesn't probably give the proper nuance to why the British were doing what they're doing. Regardless, we must credit him for kind of stepping up to the plate and, and again, uh, uh, immediately uh, starting fighting in the in New York uh, City militia. Uh, they were called the Corsicans. He, uh, as the musical asserts, does become uh, one of George Washington's chief uh, aides. Um, and eventually he finds himself appointed to Congress. All of that uh, seemed to kind of like follow in line with what the musical was trying to portray. We should, however, kind of talk about what happens at the Constitutional Convention, because that's where the musical really like this is where Nick and I really want to focus on is the legacy of Hamilton in real life. And his legacy is is interesting, to say the least, especially when we talk about economics. 
um, turning Alexander Hamilton into sort of this like pro democracy like hero is is a little bit incorrect. The man was really, I mean, here's a direct quote uh, from the notes from James Madison. This is from Alexander Hamilton as James Madison wrote it down. The English model was the only good one on this subject. The hereditary interest of the king was so interwoven with that of the nation and his personal em, uh, emoluments so great that he was placed above the danger of being corrupted from abroad. Let one executive be appointed for life who dares execute his powers. I just think that's interesting that they're having these conversations at the Constitutional Convention and this individual is advocating for basically just another king with a different name. Uh, he's not really advocating for what we would call democracy or these traditional American values. Nick, you want to chime in? No, I mean, I think that pretty much sums up his opinions at the convention. Like you said, the musical shapes him as this like pro-democracy, which I think every single quote unquote founder from that era, their image throughout history has been propped up as pro-democracy. But if you actually go back and read the notes from the convention, that's not always the case. Right? No. In fact, the opening statement is, um, from the governor of Virginia at the time, how do we structure the federal constitution to protect from democracy? That's literally the opening statement, I'm paraphrasing clearly, um, of the Constitutional Convention. But that's part of what we kind of want to dig into is whether we're talking about Hamilton or just this time period in general, there is a framing, again, of like a narrative here attached to a certain discourse and ideals that we are purported to follow to this day, although I would argue that's debatable. And yet it is, it's, it's just a celebra celebratory narrative of things that didn't really occur. Like these individuals were not interested in democracy or a government for the people. They were interested in a government for them. In this case, they, you had to be wealthy, you had to be white and you had to be a man. Um, and Hamilton, uh, regardless of his immigrant, uh, quote unquote, this is from the musical bastard background was himself considered elite by this moment in time. So I do think that's important. And he was a full blown elitist. So what we want to talk about here is how was he an elitist and how did the musical overlook these important parts of his life? Um, well, we want to talk about his time as the, uh, the treasurer of the United States under the Washington administration. The first thing that Hamilton wanted to do that we really, the, the musical touches on, I believe in one song, I forget what song it is, but it's it's about the time that Madison and Jefferson are, are, are debating whether they want to uh, uh, align themselves with uh, Hamilton uh, on these economic measures. But that's about it. It's, it's basically one song and it's only a couple of lines that are in there that really talk about the economic measures. But these are economic measures um, that have had a long lasting and for a lot of people derogating effect on the American people. The first thing that Hamilton wanted to do that is overlooked in the musical is to create a culture of debt and credit to protect the wealthy interests, motivate labor and artificially stimulate growth. Any thoughts on creating a culture of debt, Nick? Well, I mean, I think we, yeah, I don't think we can overstate the importance of that both at the federal and the individual level in our society today. Yeah, he wrote the first report on public credit, where basically he suggested splitting the debt from the war, the war for independence, into a national and state debt, then split the national owed between France and domestic war investors. When I say splitting what they owed to France and domestic war investors, what I guess I'm trying to dig at is um, we all know that that France was a heavy investor in the American war for independence for a number of different reasons. Um, which I think is also overlooked in the musical. It's not just that they were investor, but they literally helped win the, the, without the French Navy, the Americans lose that war pretty handily. But regardless, France had also invested economically. And so the United States, uh, the new United States owed France a lot of money, but they wanted to take that, that debt and separate it out from the debt they actually owed to their own wealthiest investors. Because one of the ways they financed the war was to get the wealthiest investors to buy these things called bonds. So the elites bought these bonds in basically the war effort, assuming of course they would, uh, they would pick up the interest along the way. Meanwhile, um, they paid the veterans of the war in these things called literally at the time IOUs. Those tanked, they then sold those to speculators for fractions and essentially, Hamilton, 
thinking that the vets had basically, since these IOUs meant nothing and the vets had basically sold them to speculators, that meant the veterans for the war for independence had no faith in the new government. But the wealthy investors who bought the IOUs to begin with, they were the ones that had faith in the new government, so they should be the ones that were rewarded. So he focused his repayment to those bonds to the wealthiest investors not to paying the back salaries of the veterans for the war for independence and not to paying back, um, well, the nation of France for all of its investment. Nick? I, I got nothing. That's good. I mean, again, that, 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 that kind of shows where his interests were oriented. He then also- Yeah, I think you're getting at, right, just to be frank, and they mention this, like, it's like one line in a musical his entire economic policy benefited the wealthiest uh, new Americans. I pro yeah, I probably went into too much detail there. But yes, yeah. long story short, he wanted to pay back the rich investors in the war, not pay the vets who had not been paid. Um, pe other historians of this time period will recognize that there were a number of what they called mutinies at the time by veterans from the War for Independence. Um, one of the most famous even before the Constitution was, was Shays' Rebellion, which was completely overlooked in this musical. But this shows that literal veterans of the most famous war in American history were not being compensated. Um, and he chose, rather than to pay them back, to pay back the wealthiest investors. Uh, and of course, France is also put on the back burner there. Um, regardless, he thought that if you could get all debt combined among these like 13 individual now states, that you could, of course, course coerce cooperation with the new government because some of those states were not super interested in giving up some of their autonomy to this new federal entity. But if you could, again, get them in debt, you can, I mean, if you control debt of anybody, you can control their actions. And so this debt was meant to be a control mechanism over some of these states that wanted a lot more autonomy. Um, New York, his own state actually being one of them, which is super interesting. Um, and again, Madison and Jefferson had huge uh, historically, they had huge problems, much bigger problems than they had in the musical with this. The second yeah, thing I think that it's, Hamilton- it's funny even that in the musical yeah. that's glossed over is their opposition. Like they focus on it in the musical, but even that is like way downplayed compared to how much they actually hated it. Well, I mean, Madison was, I mean, the first thing Madison wanted to do, and we, we could deconstruct Madison as well, but this isn't about Madison. He, he's, he's also an inter interesting person, Wait, but nice. he did at the bare minimum want to pay the veterans for the war for independence. That was like, he's like, we have to pay these people. They fought and died for this war. And many of them didn't do so voluntarily. People forget that the first continental army was actually heavily made up of conscripts, not volunteers, contrary to popular belief. But anyway, the second thing that Hamilton did was he created this national bank where Congress basically chartered a bank um, with $10 million in starter capital. But this is the caveat to that, to again show the elitism of Alexander Hamilton, only 20% of that $10 million investment would be owned, quote unquote, by the government or in a representative republic, that means by the people. 80% of that $10 million would be coming um, and owned by private investment. So literally, this new economy that he's creating would be 80% owned by the wealthiest new American citizens. It would be governed by a board of 25 representing private shareholders, and it, they would use tax revenue for the bank on imported spirits, which Nick will be talking about here in a little bit. Um, again, even James Madison and Thomas Jefferson opposed this. Um, why is this a problem, in your opinion, Nick, like giving 80 percent of the new national bank to private in investors? I mean, it clearly just gives control of the entire economy to private individuals, the wealthy individuals. The third thing that Hamilton really wanted to dig into um, to kind of promote this new economy, again, in his role as treasurer, which was completely overlooked in the musical, domestic production. This one we can be maybe a little bit kinder to and a little less critical. He just wants to make sure that the new country can start producing things on its own. He published a very famous document called the Report on Manufacturers, and it's interesting that this report on manufacturers wholesale rejects this uh, agrarian vision. And the reason I mention that is, you know, people that are into history will recognize that one of his opposition, Thomas Jefferson, was super into the agrarian vision. Well, Hamilton wasn't. He really wanted to promote domestic industriousness. Like we haven't hit the Industrial Revolution quite yet, but like this idea of producing goods rather than this like agrarian romanticized vision. 
So this this domestic pro pro uh, production was supported by like duties on imports. He even formed his own like little society. It was called the Society for the Establishment of Useful Manufacturers, where all the profits um, from this like this this society would go to corporate members and shareholders, um, and would not be it would be exempt from getting taxed by the United States government, which is super weird because he was super into taxation on other things. But regardless, it failed miserably. The fourth thing that he does that the, the, the musical completely omits in his role as treasurer is um, he tried to stop smuggling, which some might say is like a positive thing. But if you are about this whole American ideal of freedom, you should be able to kind of like buy what you want, where you want, however you want. And so he tried to get duties on all smuggled goods. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is literally they just fought a war for independence because the british were also trying to collect these duties so now that the country's independent one of the first things that alexander hamilton decides to do is copy the british in how they're acquiring duties on goods that americans want for way uh cheaper prices um to do this he creates this service called the revenue cutter service all the way back in 1790 and it's a little piece of trivia eventually this is what kind of becomes the united states coast guard where um they're and the united states coast guard to this day still tries to stop uh smuggling of goods that americans actually want and achieve some sort of like profit from that nick any thoughts on this no i think yeah, that is super interesting like the like you said, piece of trivia that he basically creates the precursor to the Coast Guard in an effort to stop smuggling and increase tax revenue as much as possible. And to really drive this this idea of taxation home, this whole taxation without representation, this argument that that had been in vogue, uh, you know, about a decade before this time period that we're talking about now as, as the treasurer. Um, keep in mind, like he's the treasurer, he's trying to you know, create a treasury and you have to tax to do that. So be it. The British were right. War is expensive. And the Americans find out very quickly that they also have to enact taxes. Never mind that their taxes are actually higher than what they were under the British. That, that That's neither here nor there. But what's interesting is that when we think about it this way, the new government under Alexander Hamilton began to heavily tax, just like the British had, to heavily tax its population without representing all of its population. Because we also know things decided at this constant Continental Congress were that, well, women didn't have rights and that slaves didn't have rights and they were still not sure if indigenous peoples were even peoples. They were debating these things. So, well, well over half the population is now responsible for taxation, either through like goods or whatever, or duties on goods. And they're not represented by this new government. Any thoughts on the irony here, Nick? I mean, yeah, huge, huge <laughs> irony that the new leaders of the new country basically enact almost identical policies that they just a decade earlier, like you said, fought a war against. The most, and this is the, this is like one of the real like big ones that that I emphasize a lot in in classrooms is that one of the big taxes that Hamilton thought he could he could you know um, use to to get well get revenue was an excise tax on whiskey or really all distilled spirits. And it's interesting because one of the first taxes that the British used way back in what, 1763? 1763 was like the, it was the, the Sugar Act or, but it was really meant to target like rum. And everyone was losing their minds over the British, like really trying to target rum. Because at that time, rum was the drink of the wealthy and pirates, of course, um, but mostly the wealthy. Um, but the British knew this, and so they knew that one of the first taxes they should enact would be on the citizens most uh, able to pay that tax. Hamilton decides to go the other route. Whiskey was more a drink of the poor, and he decides to focus on these like these these higher proof spirits, so that again more of the middle class or the poor are picking up the slack for this need to generate revenue rather than his elite friends. Um, Nick can go further into this excise tax on, on well, whiskey. Well, it's interesting because at the time, not only does it target the poor because the poor drink whiskey, but it also targets the farmers yep. because at the time, this was basically income for them because you couldn't store wheat for a really long time, but you could ferment it and distill it and turn it into whiskey, and that would last forever in a barrel, um, and you could use that as currency to trade and barter with other people. So basically, it was a form of kind of like an income tax. It was taxing their assets. Um, and it still exists actually to this day. The fed, both fe federal and state governments have excise tax. So as soon as you 
distill and st sell a spirit, you have to pay a tax to the government. Absolutely. Um, anyway, I mean, like these are things that we find important because, again, the whole, you know, slavery um, affair that he had or affairs, like all of that has already been deconstructed by a lot of historians um, or social commentators. But we hadn't seen a lot of people deconstruct these wildly important economic measures. I mean, if we think about it, even though like his national bank expired way back in the 1800s and so on and so forth, what he did is like, again, this is wildly important. He created in the United States this idea of a culture of debt, labor always behind the eight ball, heavy taxation, and do not question that taxation because of the new national ethos. Like these are things that are, again, these, these are major products of socialization. And we still, again, we're living them today. So that's why we think it's kind of important that the, the musical just kind of skipped right over this and turned this individual into a hero. Yeah, and I think if you ask the question of what is Alexander Hamilton's real legacy, I think that his real legacy, the most important thing that he did that still impacts the way that we economically function today were his economic policies that he enacted during the time period. Um, it, it doesn't really impact our, our lives today that he was an immigrant or that he had an affair or that he was friends with Lafayette. Like all of those things are basically irrelevant. They make for great entertainment. But as far as what he accomplished that impacts the way that we function on a daily basis in American society, it was the economic policies that he put into place. Well, and these and, economic, oh, go, sorry. Well, I was just going to really quickly mention, you know, when we're talking about unintended consequences of altering narratives is, um, you know, I was thinking about this with ma modern mathematics where we're taught, you know, the whole, if I have five apples, if I have five apples and Danny takes seven, what is that negative numbers now equate to debt? And so like from a young age, we're sort of assuming that like we even look at number structures and it's like, well, we owe something to someone. Yeah. And uh, Without I guess, the concept of debt, like that problem, it's impossible for him to take seven. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. But uh, yeah. Uh, are there any last words, any last uh, comments on, on your end? Will we kind of wrap up here? Well, I mean, there was this idea of like who might better represent that whole kind of um, American spirit or that American ethos from this time period. That was that question. Because Hamilton clearly doesn't. He, 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 I mean, what we're really trying to say in a nutshell after these, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, is that he was very much just like the British that they just overthrew. In fact, some would argue that his policies were more oppressive than what the British uh, uh, enacted. I mean, Hamilton himself enacts literally a stamp act which was one of the very acts that they were fighting against the British. So the question always arises, and, and we've heard it before, well then who should uh, Miranda made a play about uh, or a musical about that would better represent um, American values, both for then and today? Um, well, I mean, literal people of color from the time period that were awesome individuals. Benjamin Banneker deserves a musical. William Lee, Francis Marion, and notably the first Rhode Island Regiment, which is talked about in the musical, but we don't actually hear from, those individuals deserve a musical. Joseph Brandt, uh, First Nation, uh, they deserve uh, 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 a musical. Um, Abigail Adams, one of the earliest, dare we say, feminist thinkers in American history, deserves a musical. Eleanor Fry, Mary Lawton, Deborah Sampson, and all of the Daughters of Liberty, many of which pe most people have never even heard of the Daughters of Liberty, they deserve a musical. And if we really feel like we still need like the white male hero, at least use ones that kind of fought for what they fought and acted uh, the way they, they, they said they thought. And that would be Daniel Shays and his rebellion, or of course, the amazing Thomas Paine. Um, these are all individuals that didn't just like speak a, a good game, but like lived it. Does that make sense? I think it makes perfect sense. In fact, I, you know, I, I wish we were to see more of that. I was joking earlier that we'll get into James Madison more once the musical comes out. Uh, and uh, I, it's just disappointing now that I think about it 10 minutes on that that's probably something in the future. Uh, so. Um, but yeah, as we can, you know, clearly tell, we can talk about this for days, literally on end, but it's important to actually have this discussion because, you know, it's kind of clear that understanding real history and having it juxtaposed next to those produced narratives that we get from the shows like Hamilton helps us kind of understand the truth uh, a bit more, or at least 
gets us to that, uh, gets us to the truth of it, you know, uh, of what actually history is and the importance of how produced history alters our behavior now or how it can affect our own thinking and thought processes. Um, you know, so, uh, we really appreciate having you two on, um, and, you know, if if you could, we were hoping that maybe you can come back on in the future episode if we get back into this again. For sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, one last time, are there any uh, final or outgoing thoughts uh, on, on Hamilton? Um, I don't have any final thoughts on Hamilton, but I do want to take a second to plug our podcast. So Jared Thanks. and I host a podcast together. It's called The Revolution and Ideology Podcast. And we actually have a series on that podcast called Myth is America, where we deconstruct myths of american history we actually have an episode a full episode on hamilton we have a full episode on abigail adams uh we talk about the daughters of liberty and so on so you can find that at revolution and uh, we also have a youtube channel you can just go on youtube and search revolution and ideology and find us there outstanding yeah definitely go check those out because their podcasts are absolutely fantastic like i listen to one at least at least one a day uh so uh, again, thank you for coming on. We really appreciate the, the sort of balance that's been provided for our session here. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are more interested, for our viewers and listeners that are more interested in the historical details, we're going to have a link that's going to be posted up also for some of the more minor minor stuff. Um, and it's kind of like a top 10 of getting right and wrong um, about this. And uh so yeah, we'd like to invite everyone to join us again next time, live at 4 p.m. on next Tuesday. And uh, the final session will be addressing the future of how um, theater can be taken to small communities, uh, uh, sort of a theater of the oppressed um, sort of conversation uh, for some of it, and how we can move forward with productions and history in the future. So uh, thank you for your time, and we hope to see you all next week. Thank you for having us. Thank you.